And to get us started in looking at the technology, I'd like to introduce uh, Gordon Wettstein, who is Assistant Professor of Electrical Engineering and uh, Computer Science. And he's the leader of the Stanford Computational Imaging Group. It's an interdisciplinary group that's focusing on imaging, microscopy, and display systems. Uh, he's going to talk about light field technology and virtual reality. So Gordon, welcome. Well, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. As Martha just said, I'm, I'm the director of the Stanford Computational Imaging Group, and most of the projects we work on are really computational optics, computational imaging for microscopy, for cameras. But some of our interest is also in the space of computational displays. And uh, the most exciting space right now, of course, for computational imaging, computational displays, is on near-eye displays and immersive experiences. So when I think about computational imaging, it's really this bridge between modern signal processing and optimization. On the one hand, the software and uh, geometric optics, wave optics. Uh, on the other hand, that's the hardware. So we're, we're at this intersection of software and hardware. And Jeremy was already talking about you know, a little bit of the history of VR earlier today. And uh, he's been working on this for decades. And that's, uh, that's very remarkable. I had a, 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 in my first immersive, uh, if I call it immersive experience in 2003 when I started my undergraduate program back in Germany. And what we worked on there was also VR. And, and, and this, uh, you can see that here, the illusion hole is what uh, researchers in our group built. It was, was basically a cardboard box with a hole on top a CRT monitor uh, underneath. You had these stereo shutter glasses, a stylus, and th th you saw a couple of Lego blocks that he could pick up and they would fall down. And it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen uh, then, and I just decided I want to do, I want to know everything there is to know about this. I, I want to do computer graphics, I want to do displays and cameras, and, and it was an incredible experience. So now, 10 years later, or a little bit more than 10 years later, you know, we think that we're here. We think we're, we're living in the future. We have head-mounted displays, and we can create all these experiences. But to be honest, we're not quite there yet. Uh, maybe more like here. So, so this is where we were maybe 150 years ago, right? This is the stereoscope. People in Victorian times in Britain came together. They would look at these stereoscopic photographs and hold them up. And to be honest, you know, most of the technology that we have today is still very, very similar to this. Well, not quite. So over the last couple of decades, there has actually been a lot of development. So of course, Ivan Sutherland at MIT in the late 60s uh, built this incredible system. Uh, he basically invented uh, optical see-through, augmented reality, the need for computer-generated content. He had a tracker on the system. Like most of the technological components that we now have in consumer products was already in his system, and that, and that was quite incredible. Right, then in the 80s, there was a big push here in the Bay Area with VPL research and the guys who built the data glove and tried to commercialize this entire system. And that was really much more focused on the experience. So now, I think uh, where we are is that cell phone technology has evolved to the point that most of the required technological components of virtual reality are here at low cost. Uh, but they weren't developed for VR, they were developed mostly for cell phones, and that includes high resolution screens, low latency IMUs. We also have fast GPUs that render extremely high resolution content in stereo in real time, right? So that's great. But I think one distinguishing factor uh, between all these components that are just better than what we had before is that we now have the internet also. So we can create shared experiences uh, and, and, and participate in experiences that uh, you know, connect us throughout the world. So that's something very unique right now. And uh, part of the reason why I believe uh, you know, we're there almost, maybe next year, right? So in the near future, I think all of these will continue to get better. Screens will be higher resolution. IMUs will be lower latency. The form factor will be smaller, and so on. So the experiences will get better. But there are some remaining technological challenges. Uh, and I'm really just focusing on the technology here, because that's what we're working on. And, and part of that is the virgin's accommodation conflict. I'll, I'll go into detail in that, what that actually means in a second. There's the vestibular uh, visual conflict, so motion sickness, right? All kinds of you know, mismatching visual cues or uh, sensory cues that the brain gets that may create uh, discomfort for the user. So these are big problems. 
And of course, uh, augmented reality has, has many more challenges, including occlusions, form factor, battery life, heat. I mean, you can read that here, but I think right now we're almost there for VR, but optical see-through AR for wearable displays is still something that's maybe a little bit farther out right now. So what I want to go into detail a little bit more is ver the Virgin's accommodation conflict, because that's something where computational optics can really help to mitigate this. And I'd like you to really understand what the problem is. And for that, let's take a step back and just look at the human depth perception. There are many different cues that the brain uses to see 3D. And many of them are already supported by 2D displays. But there, there are a few that are a little bit more challenging. On the one hand, you have these binocular cues, stereopsis. So every, every information that you get from the fact that you have two eyes. But on the other hand, there's also these focus cues and so even if you just had a single eye, there's still a lot of rich uh, 3D information in what we perceive. And there are two different cues for each. One is an oculomotor cue, so a couple of muscles that pull either on the eyes or on the lens inside the eye that send a signal to our brain telling us what the physical state of the eye rotation, the virgins, or the focus state of the lens is. Right? That's an oculomotor cue. And then you have the visual cues that correspond to that and those include binocular disparity, so the fact that you see slightly differently shifted images with each eye, and then retinal blur, which is like a depth of field effect that you may know from SLR cameras. So in the real world, these cues all work in harmony. Our brain gets consistent cues from all the different sensors. Virgins, accommodation, retinal blur, disparity, they're all synchronized together, and our brain uses all of these cues to get a sense of you know, what's where? What's the spatial relationship between different objects in the real world? And so these cues match. In head-mounted displays today, pretty much all head-mounted displays, these cues do not match. We can create virgins and stereo disparity by showing two different images to these eyes, and that allows us to verge, to rotate our eyes in their sockets. Uh, but we cannot create focus cues. The eyes are always accommodated, focused, on a specific plane, on this virtual plane that is optically created inside the head-mounted display. So there's a lens in there, there's a physical screen. The lens makes the screen bigger and farther away, but it is a plane somewhere. You cannot ever focus at different distances with your eye, and that's a big problem. It's not so much a problem for objects that are really far away, so when you're in a virtual city, you look at things that are very far away, no problem. Things that are reasonably close, like you are, to me right now, also not a big problem. But for this personal space of interaction, anything within arm's length, things that we can touch, it's a huge problem because that's where these accommodation cues, the focus cues are most important. And if we do not create correct or visually comfortable experiences, it may be a huge problem as soon as these consumer products come out, especially when you think about games or content where you cannot really control at all times where the content is going to be. So earlier this year, we presented what we called a light field stereoscope at uh, SICRAF 2015. It's the biggest conference on computer graphics and interactive techniques. Uh, you can see the demo in the demo area here if you haven't already. It's, it's a home-built uh, display that we you know, uh, built from off-the-shelf LCD parts and driver boards that we got from eBay. Uh, we 3D printed a housing, and my students really worked very hard in putting something together that just looks some, somewhat like an Oculus Rift, right? And it uses a lot of the same components, but it has a few extra things. In particular, we have two LCDs inside at a little bit of a spacing, about six millimeters. So the form factor doesn't change very much, but you basically have two screens inside the head-mounted display. And with this simple trick and a lot of advanced computation, you can create a light field inside the head-mounted display. So what's a light field? A light field is a collection of all the light rays that uh, come from the physical world and that impinge on, on, your, on, on your visual uh, uh, field. And in this case, it's basically all the light rays that come in into the pupil, okay? So normally we see a two-dimensional image with each eye, and the light field would give us slightly different perspectives over the pupil of the eye. So you can control all these different rays coming in at different angle into the pupil. So we, we can see that here a little bit. I have these light rays. I have slightly different perspectives of the real world. Uh, they almost look the same to you on the right. That's the light field, because the amount of parallax in there is very, very uh, small. 
there isn't all that much change, but there's a little bit of parallax. And that's what is, uh, is, it's like a hologram in the real world. It allows us to focus our eyes. And if we do not recreate this in a, a digital display, we cannot focus our eyes. So what we came up with is this idea of using multiple stacked LCD layers. We developed a, a pretty complicated mathematical framework around that, implemented it on the GPU. I'm gonna spare you all the mathematical details, but the idea is really that we want to generate multiple different perspectives of the same 3D scene and make sure that these enter the pupil at different positions of the pupil. And we do not want to use eye tracking. So eye tracking would be great if we had it, but it doesn't really work very well yet. So we want to create the same experience without any eye tracking. We want to get all these different perspectives into different parts of the pupil. It's extremely challenging to do that uh, engineering-wise. But if we can do it, then we can focus our eyes. At least that's the, that's the promise. And we developed this mathematical framework. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details so much here, but uh, works reasonably well. What, what we have to do is we have to render a lot of different views of the scene, 25 images or so per eye. So that's a 50 images instead of two. Right, stereo image pair has two images. Now we have 50 images, 25 per eye on a five by five grid. We run our optimization framework in real time on the GPU and what comes out are, are two patterns that we show for each eye at these different distances. You can see them on the bottom. Uh, when they're optically overlaid, you can actually focus freely onto objects that are close by, objects that are far away, and also things that are in between these physical panels. So to convince you that this really works, I mean, I invite you to come see the demo, but what you'll see is something like this on the right, where now we take a camera with, that simulates the human eye. You focus on an object that's close, the object in the background will be out of focus. If you focus the camera on the back, the object in the back will be in focus, but the object in the front will be out of focus. We did not change anything on the display itself. This is something that just optically happens. And for a traditional head-mounted display on the left, you only have the scene in focus for one particular plane. Right? It seems like a subtle effect, but this is what really you know, generates these subtle effects that uh, create a much more immersive experience. And you may think that uh, accommodation cues are not really that important. As we get older, you know, most of us lose accommodation. But if you think about the applications for immersive displays, it's mostly gaming. At least that's what it's being marketed as right now. So all these kids who are playing games, I mean, they can really accommodate down to like 20 centimeters in front of the eye. So that's, that's really remarkable, and that's something that, that we can kind of support here. So, so the promise of light field uh, displays in head mounts is to support uh, virgins and accommodation, to mitigate this virgins accommodation conflict, create more realistic visual experiences. And I predict that at some time in the near future, this or some other incarnation of a light field display will be in any head-mounted display and it will solve the virgin's accommodation conflict. Right now, there are a couple of technological challenges. In particular, we need transparent electronics on the displays to make it, uh, get rid of the diffraction artifacts and make it very transparent. Uh, we don't have displays that have those transparent electronics right now, so it's a little bit challenging. So we thought, can we come up with a much simpler solution that is immediately applicable right now? And we came up with this idea of monovision. So monovision is a technique that's been used for decades in ophthalmology for people who have presbyopia. You, most of the time they get bifocals, so you have little insets for reading, right? So you look through these insets to read, you look up and you can see far. But monovision is a different and alternative technique where you have two different prescription lenses for each eye. So one eye will see far, one eye sees close, and your dominant eye will switch and our brain is incredibly good at suppressing the blurry content. So we always pick out the better content. And we thought, well, uh, this could be so easy, we can just, uh, but we need to evaluate it for applications in VR. It's very easy to implement. You just put a secondary lens in front of your head-mounted display on the one side, uh, but there are potential disadvantages, like discomfort, uh, do we uh, change the visual acuity, is the depth perception impaired, or does it even do anything meaningful in general? So, so what we set out to do is we wanted to test that. We built a display prototype that, uh, where we hacked a DK2, basically. We put focus tunable optics into the lenses so we can electronically control where these lenses are focused and we can, at any point in time, change the accommodation state for each eye uh, separately. And we use these liquid lenses that are programmable from OptoTune. 
they uh, give us an accommodation range from 10 centimeters to optical infinity. Mm -hmm. And we can either adjust that based on the scene, for example, if you had eye tracking and you know where you're looking at, just adjust the focus where you're looking at, or we can fix it to a particular object, we can set them at different distances, at the same distances, and so on. You could alternatively use actuated screens inside the physical uh, uh, head-mounted display as well. And we ran a couple of user studies. One was a user preferences study where we showed people randomly uh, uh, you know, scenes that, and asked them which one they liked better. And the other one was a user performances study where we uh, tested visual acuity and, and depth perception. And so people like the natural state the best. So if we know where they're looking at and we focus the lenses to that plane, they like that the best. That's the red one. The normal mode where you're focused on a particular plane is the worst and monovision is somewhere in between. So it is visually comfortable. We also tested uh, depth perception and uh, visual clarity and showed that it really improves the performance of people. Uh, unfortunately, my time is running out, so I'm just gonna give you the summary. The summary is that for objects at very close distance, you can better distinguish between depth between objects. It's more visually comfortable. The reaction times are shorter. You can read very small things more clearly than for the regular display mode. So it's really something that uh, can have a, a, a tremendous impact on the user performance by simply uh, putting one lens, uh, an additional prescription lens in front of one of these lenses. And you can see the demo also there. We have the light field stereoscope and also the monovision demo. Um, I, I'm, I apologize for running a little bit over time here, but uh, I'm open for questions if we have any time. Mm -hmm.